Good morning, everybody. So nice to be here. Um, it's good to be at the workshop. So much love from everybody. Nice to see Janine and Kurt as well. And um, just awesome to meet so many beautiful people. There's so much love. People want to make everybody feel welcome. So thank you for making my wife and I um, feel welcome. Um, you know, as I was thinking about the workshop, I've, I've, I was sort of part of the um, early journey in the workshop when, um, if, you, if those of you don't know how I know Brett and Kim, we go way back. I actually knew Brett first, we played baseball together, and um, I actually, now when I just got saved, um, Brett and I were in the same church together, we served together for the first probably five years or so, um, and so when they wanted to start the workshop, I was actually a part of that journey um, so I know a lot about, you know, just the, the vision for it, the heart for it, what you guys want to get. And one thing that stands out about the workshop is really an authentic community, you know, and a, an authentic sense of love, an authentic sense of wanting to actually connect into people's worlds. And um, my wife and I live in uh, Sydney. I'm originally from Paro. There we go. Uh, from the northern suburbs. Uh, I grew up in Lansdowne and then we moved to Paro, so I lived there before we moved, um, and we are part of a beautiful church in Sydney called the Ryzen Church, with um, pastors Brad and Alison Bono. And um, but we, I just want to honor Brett and Kim, even in their absence. Brett's playing baseball; he's still holding that one up. I have stopped playing baseball; I no longer play anymore. I've now taken up golf. So uh, <laughs> they say young people don't play golf, and so I'm, I don't know. I'm enjoying it, and um, but. I just want to honor them, you know, for their, for their faith and their sacrifice. And you know what? It's, they always think about you. They're always talking about you. They're always talking about the church. And they always speak well of you. You know, whenever they call us, you know, they're this person and that person and that person's baby. And, and they're really interested in the church and they just want to take it forward. And, um, but one, one person I also want to honor is Carl. Carl Arendtse is an awesome man of God. Carl is actually part of um, the early parts of me knowing God. And, you know, he taught me how to prophesy. He taught me how to, you know, see in the Spirit. And, you know, what? He, he's just an awesome man of God. And, Carl, I just want to honor you for, you know, investing into me in those early days and being a part of my life. And I appreciate that. Um, and so before I preach this word today, um, I just want to say that... Um, I've, I've been serving God for about probably 11 years now. That's not to boast, but what I want to say is that I'm going to say something today, and a lot of what I'm going to say, you're probably going to know. You're probably going to be like, oh, I know that. But you know what? I, I went through a time, probably in the last two to three years, where I went, oh, I know that. You know, ah, uh, no, that's not really important. Mm. And so we get, this, we get into this position where we're a bit resistant. We're a bit, ah, uh, I know that. That's not for me. You know what, give me the deep stuff. So, you know, and in, in the last year or so, I've just been taking myself on a journey that no matter the vehicle of God's Word, no matter the channel of God's Word, you know what, I choose to go, I'm going to have an open heart. I can learn and I can receive. So you guys want to pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful church called The Workshop. Lord, we thank you that this church's doors is open. We thank you that revival is breaking out in Woodstock. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that the fire of God shall be poured out in this atmosphere. Lord, we thank you that the people in this house ultimately make a difference to everybody that they come into contact with. Lord, I pray that as I minister this morning, I pray that your supernatural touch would be on it. Lord, we hunger and thirst for your presence. We hunger and thirst for a move of your Spirit. So Holy Spirit, come and burn in us. Come and make a difference. Come and breathe on the Word. Holy Spirit, be the after teacher. Minister to every person individually into their situations. And all God's people said, Amen. As I was preparing, I um, stay woke. What a cool name. Stay woke. That is awesome. Anyway, uh, but you know what? As I was preparing and praying, um, I actually felt two things um, for the workshop prophetically of where you guys are as a church. And funnily enough, I haven't spoken to Brett yet, so I, um, I don't know how I'll confirm this is, but there were two things that I really felt for the workshop was that it is a season of rest and transition for the workshop. It is a season of restoration and transition in the workshop. It is a time of restoration to bring back, to reestablish, to form a condition. And a time where God will give back what you have lost. What you have lost in time, what you have lost in soul, what you have lost in person, what you have lost in desires, in dreams, in passions, and maybe even opportunity. God is going to give it back. 
God does not do restoration. He is a restorer. So there's a difference between me actually doing something out of I just want to do it, and there's a difference between I am a restorer. That shows that I care affectionately. That shows that I am interested in your thing. What, and I felt these, that this is what God is going to restore. I felt the first thing that He's going to restore is the joy of your salvation. He's going to restore the joy of your salvation. That's what David said, create in me a clean heart and restore to me the joy of my salvation. Serving in church has maybe just become as usual. You know, being in the kingdom of God has just become maybe a little bit normal and it's a bit mundane, but you know what? God's going to give a new spark and a new joy. He's going to restore your strength. He's going to restore your strength. You know what? One of the will of God, um, the keys in accessing the will of God and in drawing in the will of God is actually that you need to be in a position of strength. You need to be in a position where you, you have capacity to actually endure. You have capacity to withstand. You have ca capacity to go through storms. You have the capacity to go through valleys. And you know, I found this beautiful scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 3. It said, David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his power at the river Euphrates. He went, and I love that, his, where was his strength restored? His strength was restored at the river. His strength was restored at the river. And sometimes we can go to all types of places to try to get restoration for strength. Maybe we'll go to our job. Maybe we'll go to our finances. Maybe we'll try to find it in something else. But you know what? He went to the river. What, what, the river is a picture of God's presence. The river is a picture of that place of connection where there's a flow of God's spirit into our lives. He's going, and this is a very popular one. I see um, the workshop posted this on the Instagram photo a while back. He's going to restore your soul. He's going to restore your soul. You know what? Sometimes one thing that seasons can take out of us, especially tough ones, is that we feel like something has been taken away. In our person, we feel like, man, there was just a little bit of emotion that I lost there. You know, there's maybe just a little bit of something in me that I lost. And you know what? God is going to give that back. <laughs> just a little. And one thing I felt as well, that he's actually going to restore your finances. He's going to restore your finances. And I feel that there's maybe been some loss in opportunities. Maybe you have missed out, but God's going to give that back. The Bible is filled with scriptures that speaks about, it speaks about restoration of fortunes. That's the word that it used, but God is going to restore those. Can you believe that and say amen? Amen. amen. One thing that I noticed in a lot of the photos that I don't see here today is the plant. Have you seen the green plant that normally stands over here? And it's funny because in our house, our house is filled with beautiful plants and my wife actually gets me to talk to them. You know, they all got a little name and you got to say, oh, you're so beautiful and, you know, and you can't say any bad things to them. And so I was hoping that plant was going to be there, but it's not there. Um, but one thing that I want to talk about today, I said that the first part is that you guys are in a season of restoration, but I actually felt and this is what I'm going to preach on today, is that you are in a season of transition. You are in a season of transition. Life by default is filled with many ages and stages. It's a journey filled with moments in time that have the ability to refine us and set our lives on a particular path. There are stages that will require us to adjust and respond to change. If you look back on your own life, there should be moments that resemble these ages and stages. For some, it could be the day you got married. I know when my wife and I got married, funny story, I got, you know, lift up the toilet, bar, the toilet seat, she wants it down, you know, the, the toothbrushes have got to go in the cupboard, they can't be on there. So we went through a little bit of change in that. For some, it could be making room for a newborn baby or the addition of a second or third child. For some, it could be a career change. For some, it could be a change in physical location. Either you have moved cities or moved into a place that is a bit unfamiliar, where maybe you have left family and friends. I know for a fact, when I moved to Sydney, I, I, I was on my own. I didn't have any family or friends, and I left my mother and my father and, and what was familiar. And I had to adapt, and I had to enter a season of transition. For some of you, maybe the workshop could be a new environment. Maybe you came from another church or recently gave your life to Jesus and you're wondering what all this Jesus business is all about. For some, it might be a bit more challenging and unforeseen. Maybe it could have been the loss of a loved one, a financial change that has caused strain, maybe a marriage under fire, or even 
physical challenge or sickness. But it's clear that life is filled with periods of change and moments of transition. Transition, by definition, means the process or passage of change from one state or condition to another. It is a movement or development or evolution from one stage or style to another. The Hebrew word for transition is abba, and it actually means to cross over or to go beyond. You know what? When you think about God, you can't actually but think of movement. When you think about God, you actually can't think about transition. God by nature is a God of movement. God by nature is someone who's always going from stage to stage. He's never standing still. If you think about creation, he goes day one. He doesn't sleep the next day. As they say, my dad calls Cape Town slap stut. There's no slap stut with God. Second day he goes, he's still moving. He's creating again. Day three, he's creating again. If you think about it, God is always on the move and God is on the move in your life. When moving from one state to another, to the intended state God has for us, Scripture shows us that His end is good and designed to bring the best out of us. You said that this morning. It's like she said it so beautifully. The intended conclusion of the season is your goodness. The intended end is always your goodness. And I'm going to read a few Scriptures just for a moment. Ephesians 3 verse 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. James 5.11, Indeed we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the intended end by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And we know in Job 42 that Job actually got Double for his trouble, as they say. First Corinthians chapter two, verse six to ten. And just I'm going to point out the one verse out of the message. That why we have that is why we have the scripture text. No one's ever seen or heard anything like this. Never so much as imagined anything quite like it. What God has arranged for those who love Him. How can I tell you that, you know what, you might feel in a constricted season, you might feel in a wilderness season, but I want to let you know that there's a bit of an arranging going on with God. There's a bit of an arranging, He's moving pieces. You think you're without, you think you're forsaken. I want to let you know He's bringing some new relationships. You think that load shedding is about to bring that business down. I want to let you know God is going to bring some new things into your life. I had an interesting conversation. We met up with some friends last night, and I just had such a laugh. We were talking about load shedding. And um, I was talking, and he was like, we're talking about load shedding, and we're laughing. And he, and he stopped, and he went, but load shedding actually has its ups and its downs, you know? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> it's ups and its downs, but anyway, maybe he connects with his girl during that time. I don't know. <laughs> think, but think about how God is acquainted with transition and change, change that comes with it. He told Abram to move from a land that was familiar to the unfamiliar. He told Moses how he has seen the affliction of his people and how he'll take them from captivity to a land flowing with milk and honey. When Elisha asked for a double portion in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, Elisha responded and said, You have asked for a hard thing, but if you see me when I pass, the mantle will fall on you. And as Elisha walks, he journeys with Elijah and he walks through four stages. The first stage he goes through is Gilgal. And Gilgal speaks of a place of cutting away. It speaks of a place where specifically where shame and reproach is taken away. And if you are in Christ, you have no reason to be shameful. You have no reason to be shameful of anything that you're experiencing. The second stage he goes through, he goes goes to Bethel. What is Bethel? Bethel is the house of God. Bethel is a place of encounter. Bethel is a place where we experience His presence. It is a place of community. Next stage he goes through, he goes to a place called Jericho. What is Jericho? Jericho is a place of faith. It is a place of victory. It is a place where we trust God to see the impossible. I like what Stephen Furtick says. He says, transition is an opportunity for you to put your trust in God. And the fourth place he goes through before he actually, before the mantle actually falls on him and he strikes the water, he goes to a place called Jordan. Jordan speaks to the place of crossing over and moving to the other side. The beautiful thing about the Jordan River, it means to flow down. And I believe that the Jordan also reveals those points where we find rhythm and flow in God's purpose. 
You know what, for some of you, I think it has been a little bit of a, you know, you feel that you've been going through Gilgal, you've been going through that Bethel, you've been going through that Jericho where you're going through a little bit of discomfort. But you know what, you come into a place called Jordan, a place of transition, where you actually start walking in the flow of God's purpose, where there's more rhythm, where there's more rest, where there's more, just a more, a stronger, stronger flow. And you find comfortability in the uncomfortable. You find comfortability in seeing God's purpose and doing the impossible. Even our Lord experienced the need for transition when giving His life and leaving a kingdom mandate to 12 unschooled, ordinary men. Transition is inevitable. You will go through it. I always want to challenge myself sometimes. I go, if I'm not feeling transition, if I'm not feeling change, I wonder if I'm sitting down for too long. Because we can get comfortable sitting down. You know what's one of the most, whenever God calls us to a new stage, you know what's the one of the most frequented words God uses? He says, arise. He says, arise. Why? Because as humans, we, by default, we get used to sitting down. By default, we get comfortable in that chair. We get comfortable in that season. And um, I'll touch on that point in a moment. Just to recap and reinforce, transition is a spiritual and practical process that moves us from one state to another. Transition is an inevitable, inevitable part of our life's journey. God is a God of movement. And the way he leads our lives is generally based on periods of change and transition. And he's usually going to do it more than once. Periods of transition are followed by God's goodness. The inevitable end and conclusion of a season is God's goodness. And this is, this is interesting. Transition can be frustrating. You know why? Because there is a conflict between God, what God wants to do in me and what I currently have. I see God's promises, but I'm right here. I see the promised land, but I'm stuck in the wilderness. I feel that God has placed in my heart a burden to start a business, but I have no money. <laughs> I feel like God has called our family to do a particular thing, but I feel so constricted. And you know what? It's in that time where we actually got to draw into God, where we've got to draw from His Word. And you know what? I found such an awesome passage of Scripture that we can go to. Passage of Scripture. A passage of Scripture, excuse me. And so we can just... Turn on your Bibles to Joshua chapter 3, if you do have one. Unfortunately, I didn't give the media, the media team our scripture, so it won't go on. So if you can just listen, Joshua chapter 3. And um, I'm just going to give you a few keys to handle periods of transition. Just a few things that can help you get a hold on a season. I'm a lawyer. I'm very factual, so I, wanna, I want the evidence. You know, I, I want the things in order. I want the list. So I'm a very point preacher. I, want, I actually have like four or five points that I'm going to give you. So I'm very ordered in that way. But um, keys to handle periods of transition. Let's um, look at Joshua chapter 3 verse 1 if you're there. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, which is the place of transition. And he and all the people of Israel... And he lodged there before they passed over. Before they got into the promised land, it says that Joshua rose up early in the morning. The first thing to handle seasons of transition is maintain your enthusiasm and expectation. You know what? When you're going through a period of uncertainty, where you're going through a period that you actually don't know what's going on, I want to encourage you maintain enthusiasm and expectation. You know, a lot of the times the enemy will want to come into your space. He will try to get a seat at your table, and he'll try to go, oh, you know what, you don't need to get your hopes up. You know what, this season that you're going to go through, this next one, oh, none of this faith stuff, you know. I don't. He, he'll try to keep you in a place of unbelief. He'll try to keep you in a place of doubt. You know, Romans 12, I love that scripture. It says, keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You know, as you go through seasons that might have, and, and that's the thing, that's the danger of the wilderness. The danger of the wilderness is that it processes you to stay the same. It processes you to stay in a, in a place of contentment where you actually got to be reaching out for more. Second point, verse 3 to verse 4. The officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levit Levitical priests, then you will set out from your place and follow it. Yet there will be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. My second point is trace the presence of God 
and the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's a very simple one, but trace the presence of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was a picture of God's presence. It was a symbol to let them know that God is in their midst. And the beautiful thing about the advantage that we have through Jesus Christ is, I love this because it said the, the presence of God, the, the picture, the symbol of God's presence, it's actually going to be at a distance. The beautiful thing in the New Testament is that the presence of God doesn't need to be at a distance. The presence of God in the New Testament is so close. I grew up Anglican and one of the benedictions we gave at the end was, now may the love of the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. What does that fellowship mean? That fellowship speaks about closeness. That fellowship speaks about connection. That fellowship also speaks about vulnerability. That we have to go, okay, God, I'm open to what you are saying. You know, as Stay Woke said, <laughs> you know, as Stay Woke said, he said, sometimes we don't know what the season is going to hold. Sometimes we need to listen to what that, those unreasonable things that God is going to tell us to do. He's going to let us know some things that doesn't make sense. My third point, verse 5. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The New Living Translation says, purify yourselves. My third point is, in seasons of transition, maintain a posture of holiness. Maintain a posture of holiness. Holiness doesn't always necessarily mean doing good, even though that is a big part of holiness. But holiness in Christ is actually that we have a free gift of sanctification. The Bible says that Christ is our sanctification <laughs> and he is our redemption so holiness as much as it, as it is about doing good it's actually about knowing who you are in Christ it's about knowing who you are in Christ Jesus said be holy for what I am holy that's not a commandment that is an instruction to say hey stay connected to me hey follow me hey you know I'm, I'm not a father yet but you know what one of the most beautiful things about fathers is, is when they see their kids doing what they do. And you know what? Sometimes in seasons, I, I want to let you know you don't want to be like anyone else but Jesus in uncertainty. You want to go, Lord, show me who I am in this season. Lord, if you, what would good old WWJD, what would Jesus do? <laughs> if I was in, Lord, if you were in this, because that, that, that's what the Holy, that's what, that's the function of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is actually to reveal to us the mind of God. The Holy Spirit's function is to show us what's in God's heart. And you know what? Sometimes we can get disconnected for what God has in His heart for us. And, and not by distance in terms of, I don't want God. You're going, oh, you know what? Because I'm, I'm a bit fearful, Daryl said it, that He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. That's not about, I don't want God, but I'm going, man, he's gonna, He might say something that's going to challenge me. He might say something that's going to disrupt. God by nature is a disruptor. He shows up on the scene and he disrupts very quickly. And so you, you, you have a little bit of a tendency to shy away to go, oh, he's going to tell me something that I'm not going to like that much. But you know what? He's encouraging us in seasons of transition. Stay close. Stay close and be like me. Can you say amen? Amen. Maintaining a posture of holiness also speaks to um, a vessel that is available, a vessel that is, I love the phrase that everybody just uses in the workshop is that we here for you, we here for you. I think that's such a beautiful phrase and culture that we're not here for ourselves. Um, 2 Timothy verse 2 to 21, I love the scripture. Therefore it says, therefore if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel, get this, for honorable use, set apart as holy useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Who wants to be available to the master of the house? Who wants to be ready for every good work? Amen. My fourth point, you can see that in verse 9 of Joshua chapter 3, and it says, And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. In seasons of transition, when we're passing over from one stage to another, I want to let you know one of your most key things is that you have to have an increased appetite for God's word. 
When you're going through seasons of transition, don't let Google be your number one source. I'm a, I'm a Googler. Google, how do I get here? Oh, Google, you know, what's the best clothes at the moment? I love to Google, but you know what? And I, and I love facts, and I love reading books, and I love, you know, I wouldn't say amusing myself. I love different sources of information, but there's sometimes when, when seasons of transition are so dear, I need something stronger. I need something that's a bit more durable. That latest book on leadership that you're reading, it is not strong enough to carry you through a season of transition. You need something strong, and that is the Word of God. Hebrews 11 verse 3 says that um, by faith, the heavens and the earth were created through the Word of God. That's how powerful it is. It says He spoke His Word and He healed them. You need something stronger in seasons of transition. I love this one. In seasons of transition, and this is more true for the workshop, foster a culture of trust. Foster a culture of trust amongst each other. You know, the beautiful thing about this transition in Joshua chapter 3 was that Joshua was not the only one giving, he was not the only one doing something. Everybody was doing something. It said that he had officers. It said that he had priests. And everybody played their function. I'll let you know that everybody wouldn't have been able to play their function properly if there wasn't a culture of trust. And you know what, as you reach Woodstock, as you, excuse me, that's too small, as you reach the city of Cape Town, I want to let you know that you guys need to trust each other. You guys, one thing that I, when I was praying for the workshop this morning, one thing that I felt was, was that, you know, um, John 4 verse 35 says, lift up your eyes for now is the time of harvest. And when, whenever Bi the Bible speaks about reaching people and growing church, it actually uses it in a, in a harvest context. And one thing that I felt was, was that um, the Lord is giving the workshop a bigger sickle. The sickle is the one that you use to get the harvest. And I felt that the sickle was, you had the small sickle for a season, but as you're going to a season of transition and greater influence in the city, I believe God has given you a bigger sickle. Can you say amen to that? So we foster a culture of trust. I was reading a book, and um, they, there was a, a recent, if I'm talking loud, sorry, I can't actually hear myself. <laughs> but um, in, I, was reading a, I was reading a book, and they were actually trying to figure out what makes Google so successful. Because, I mean, Google's one of, I think it's top three or probably the most richest company in the world. But they were wondering, what is, what, is this, what is the ingredient that makes Google successful? And they went, is it the talent? Because they recruit the best talent. They recruit top talent. They have the best systems. They have the best operations. They have all these beautiful things. And they wondered why. <laughs> and they actually narrowed it down that the, the Google's secret ingredient is actually the proximity of their top leadership that their top leadership are close enough to each other to engage with each other on a regular basis. And that extends into a culture of trust. So if we want to see the, the workshop go to another level and do greater things and see greater success in the area of just reaching the world, I want to encourage you to have a culture of trust. So my first point was maintain enthusiasm and expectation. Second point was trace the presence of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Maintain a posture of holiness so we can be fit vessels for God's use. Increase your appetite for God's word and have it there as your principal thing. And foster a culture of trust. My final point, and if I can maybe just have the guitarist just to play in the background, and that would be nice. Let the sixth point that I got, and this is my final one. Let your transition be marked by rest. Let your transition be marked by rest. And you can look at verse 13, and it says, When the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, the feet shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The, and then the waters of the Jordan will be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above will stand in one heap. And you know what the beautiful thing was? Was actually during this time, it says that the, the, the banks were overflowing. And the funny thing about the Jordan is that the Jordan doesn't have a shoreline. The Jordan is one side this side, one side this side, and you got to step in. And sometimes God will ask you to step into your moment of transition when the tides are high. Sometimes He'll ask you to step into that season of transition when things don't make sense, where things are a bit unusual. Oh, 
rest, rest, rest. I, I feel that this just, come on, just lift your hands for a few moments. Just close your eyes, say, Lord, that rest is for me. That rest is for me. I, I choose not to fret. Thank you, Lord. Rest speaks about surrendering control. You are not in charge of your season. You are not in charge of your season. You might have thought you can pull it together. You might have thought you can handle it, but I want to let you know, surrender control to that situation. Surrender control to that circumstance. I feel some of you have had a lot of quarrels with family members. You know what? Rest in God. Rest in God. Rest in God. Rest in God. Just receive His rest right now. Just receive His rest right now. Holy Spirit, pour out your rest in this place. Pour out your rest in this place. You know what I feel like just in the book of Judges with Gideon, it says when they defeated the Midianites, they were exhausted yet pursuing. They were exhausted. And I feel that there's a bit of exhaustion. But God is replacing that right now. He's replacing that right now. In closing, as I bring this message to a close, one of the most beautiful things about periods of transition is this. And you will see it in the splitting of the Red Sea. You will see it in the stages of Elijah and Elisha that I spoke about. And you will actually see it in this story with Joshua crossing over. <laughs> they all end with this phrase. And they walked over on dry ground. They walked over on dry ground. What does that speak of? That speaks about God's miraculous power. That speaks about God doing what only He can do. You know, when I moved to Sydney, one of the things that I um, had to do was go through a whole immigration and visa journey. And it cost a lot of money. Um, it was, timing was so specific because we had to be back in South Africa for our wedding. And there was just a whole bunch of things connected to it that I couldn't really handle myself. I just had to let it go. And you know what? As I was going through, I felt God say, just rest in me. Just rest in me. Surrender control to that situation. And I want to let you know, money came through out of nowhere, like to the amount. <laughs> like it cost X amount of dollars. It was like $2 that we got. That was a, just a bit more. You know what? I had so much peace because I chose to rest. And you know what? No matter what you are going through today, I want to let you know that you can walk through and dry ground. But surrender control to His goodness. And you know, one thing that I want to close off with and we will worship for a moment is Joshua's heading this period of transition and he goes over and the water split and he walks through on dry ground. And an angel appears to him and says, <laughs> and it was actually, it's a, picture of Jesus Christ it's the angel of the Lord and he says whose side are you on Joshua asked him whose side are you on he says neither <laughs> but it says that Joshua fell down and worshipped that's your key ingredient in your season of transition you know what just when you don't know when you mark by uncertainty you know why don't you lift your hands and give him some praise you know what one, one translation says Joshua took off his shoes and he waited a while and worship. You know what that speaks of? That speaks about space. That says, you know what, I'm not just going to give God like two seconds. You know what, I'm, I'm going to bask in His presence. I'm going to bask in His presence and I'm going to let His presence make the difference. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just for these next few moments, maybe you're in this place and you say, you know what, Carl, this word to me this morning has spoken. I feel that I've lost some things. I feel that I need restoration. I feel that my family needs restoration. You might be in this place and you might feel, hey, I feel a bit broken. And you say, I need restoration. Or maybe in this place and you say, hey, my family is going through a season of transition. My wife and I are going through a season of transition. Me and my calling, I feel God is calling me to bigger and greater, but I feel stuck. But I feel the call to transition this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. Why don't you lift your hand and say, that's me and I'll pray for you. There we go. I'll pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'll pray for you. Lord, you see every hand in this atmosphere. You see the need for restoration. You see the need for transition. Lord, and I pray in Jesus' name that you will give a special touch. Lord, that you will work in their hearts in a mighty way. 
And Lord, that you would ultimately be the difference factor. Lord, where they feel like the waves are raging all around them, in Jesus' name, I speak peace. Lord, where they feel like their soul is vexed and they've lost. Lord, I pray for the balm of Gilead. I pray for the comforting touch of the Holy Spirit even right now. Lord, I pray for the streams of living water, God, to flow over every person. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Is, is your name Angelo? Your name's Angelo, eh? As we were praying, I felt God is going to use you powerfully. I know that's quite a basic thing to say, but God is going to use you powerfully. And I felt that you are actually an influencer. You, you're going to be an influencer, and specifically within leadership, within business. You're going to speak into society. You're going to speak into cities. You're going to speak into nations. God is going to, I believe even right now, God is moving your heart. You feel unsettled. You feel like there's more to my call. There's more that I'm called to do in God. And I, I can see your wife feels that as well. Your wife knows who you are. Your wife knows that there's a giant in you. And you know what? God is calling you to greater and bigger. But I feel, you know what? I feel that prayer is going to be a weapon. I feel got to get into God's presence and pray and say, God, open those doors. Open those doors, Jesus. Daryl and Tanya, oh. I, you guys know the level of call that is on your life. But I feel God is going to do such. I, I believe that you guys actually carry, it's no doubt that you carry a healing anointing. You carry a healing anointing. But you, I, I feel that you're, you've been resistant to touch the broken a little bit. But I feel God is going to restore. And I, feel, I, I see a double portion of what you've lost. I see a double portion of people. You've maybe reached 100, but it's going to be 200. You thought you lost it, but God's going to restore it. And so, Lord, I just pray for Daryl and Tanya. I thank you, God, for what you are doing in their lives. I thank you that they are mighty men and women of God. Lord, I thank you that you're going to draw them out in a powerful way. Lord, I even see the multitudes of people being healed, multitudes being restored to you, multitudes getting their soul in the right place, God, because of their voice. Lord, I see that. I see the Lord even touching your tongue right now. That your tongue is going to be like the pen of a ready writer. You're going to be able to say the right things. You're going to be able to speak into situations where psychologists have maybe written people off, where counseling programs have written people off. Your voice will bring healing because your voice carries something deeper and something stronger in Jesus' name. The lovely lady with the blue dress on, I heard you sing. <laughs> oh. there's, a, there's, there's a worshiper in you. There's a worship in you, and, and you're actually going to lead multitudes in worship. I felt that you've had a conflict in what's, what's this music thing all about. What, what am I called to do? But I, I believe that God is calling you to worship. And you will actually be a leader of leaders. You won't, you won't just have a band. You will, you will influence men and women to lead worship. You will, you will, you will, and you will carry a mantle. People will get saved in God's presence when you sing no altar call. People will get healed just like that with you seeing because I see there's 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 um sometimes some of our greatest ministries and come out they come out of our greatest tests they come out of our greatest agonies and I feel that you're gonna you're gonna minister powerfully to broken people women are gonna be weeping in God's presence and they're gonna be healed as you sing so good and then the beautiful lady who sang today I just want to pray for you Lord I thank you for this beautiful woman of God Lord, I pray, God, that as she takes on the worship um, leadership position in, in, in the workshop, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you will help her usher in heaven, that you will help her usher in heaven. Lord, I pray, God, where she's gone through a wilderness dry season, Lord, I thank you that you are the one who makes rivers in the wilderness in Jesus' name. I thank you that you are the God of the turnaround. I literally see the rain of God's presence falling over you. You felt like you've gone through a dry spell. You felt like you've gone through a dry season. You felt like the Bible speaks about a barren place where there's no water. You felt like you are in that place. But I see the Holy Spirit pouring out His refreshing rain. And I see your voice just gushing out. Your voice just gushing out streams of living water. Just gushing out and refreshing God's people. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your your beautiful church. We thank you that every person shall be uplifted and every person shall make a difference in Jesus' name. Amen.